So Sister Soma asked me to talk about the basic overarching principles of Buddhism today. So for some of you this might be old, familiar stuff. Uh, for others it might be quite new. Um, but regardless of which, which it is, uh, whenever encountering the Dharma, whenever listening to a talk or reading a Dharma book, uh, it's always important to approach it with a fresh mind. So setting aside whatever we think we know uh, about Buddhist practice, uh, Buddhist principles, uh, and opening up to the possibility that we might either learn something new, we might hear something that we haven't heard before, or we might hear something in a different way. Uh, even if we hear the exact same material, we're different people. Uh, and our circumstances are different. So naturally then, it will affect us differently. So even if you've heard the exact same talk about the Four Noble Truths last year and the year before and the year before, uh, you might find that this time something new comes through. Uh, some shift in perspective occurs. Uh, so in the suttas, uh, it talks about uh, in a number of places, it talks about the proper attitude when listening to a Dhamma talk. Uh, and the Buddha, uh, he says, uh, one listens as though it was a matter of vital concern. Uh, so, mm, devoting one's entire attention to it as though it was a matter of vital concern. So we approach uh, the Dharma with that kind of attitude, that attitude as though it was something extremely important, extremely valuable, uh, something which our life depends upon. Uh, so if your life depends upon something, then mm, that's not the time when we space out and think about unicorns and cheese and whatever else it is we think about. I don't actually think about unicorns or cheese, but <laughs> fill in the blank, whatever it is you think about. <laughs> Maybe cheese, I think about cheese sometimes. Uh, but unicorns only seems to come up when I'm giving talks, I don't know why. Uh, so, uh, really treating it as something which, uh, which your life depends upon, because from one perspective it does. Um, Buddhism is, uh, in some places, it's described as the, the way to go beyond birth and death. So you might say, well, what's wrong with birth? It's like, well, because birth always comes along together with death. With, uh, with birth comes decay, decrepitude, sickness, affliction. Uh, and ultimately dying. Uh, and so it's, it's looking at this, this process. Uh, and this process of, of birth and death is not necessarily something that we need to think of in terms of uh, 80 years or 100 years. It's actually something that we can see in each moment. Uh, in each moment we produce a, a sense of self-identity and uh, that self-identity is built around our preferences. Uh, it's built around our likes and dislikes. It's built around our wants. It's built around uh, what, we, what we long for, or what we seek to gain or what we seek to avoid. Uh, it's built around our, our opinions, uh, our viewpoints, uh, which often we cling to more tightly than anything else in the whole world. Uh, we cling so desperately to my way of seeing the world, my way of thinking about the world. Uh, to the point where often we'd rather have my perspective than an accurate perspective. Uh, so it's recognizing that in each moment we're born into this, this sense of self, we're born into this personality, we're born into this, this self-identity that we create. So it's both a product of the past decisions we've made, uh, the past habits we've cultivated, habits of liking certain things, habits of pursuing certain things, habits of thinking in certain ways, habits of feeling in certain ways, habits of 
nourishing certain emotions and crushing other emotions, habits of paying attention to certain parts of our experience and ignoring other parts of our experience. We build up all those habits and tendencies over the course of many, many lifetimes. And that all gives us this very strong impetus to think and feel and behave and perceive uh, in a particular way in each moment. And also in that moment we make choices. Uh, we choose how to be. Uh, we choose how to feel. We choose how to perceive uh, in each moment. So it's strongly shaped by our past habits, strongly shaped by our past de uh, decisions. Uh, but it's not determined by our past decisions. We still have the freedom in each moment to change how we're using our mind, uh, to change how we perceive the world, how we feel uh, in each moment. So that's the process of birth happening moment by moment. Uh, we're born into a particular body and mind in each moment. Uh, and the question is, what are we going to do now? What are we going to do with this condition that we have? And ultimately we can do whatever we want. Uh, so that's one of the, the lovely things about uh, the Buddhist perspective is that uh, it is not rigidly deterministic. Uh, rather, it does incorporate this, this strong element of, of choice, and that in each moment we can choose what we're going to do with that moment. So, uh, basically, there really only comes down to two choices. Uh, well, from a Buddhist perspective, there's two choices. Uh, mm -hmm. There's to choose to move towards enlightenment or choose to move away from it. That's really it. Um, everything else is just shades of those two. So, uh, ultimately then, Buddhist practice is about, in each moment, choosing to move towards awakening choosing to, to shift our experience to be more in line with the experience of a Buddha, uh, of an enlightened being. Uh, it's constantly, moment by moment, choosing to rewrite our patterns, to rewrite our habits, to rewrite our perceptions, to match that of an awakened being, to become that of an awakened being, to manifest the qualities and characteristics of an awakened being. Another way of looking at this uh, which is equally valid, uh, is that moment by moment what we're choosing to do is to remove the unenlightened behaviors, to remove the thought patterns and emotional tendencies and perspectives of an unenlightened being, uh, such that we're simply revealing uh, the innate purity of the mind. We're revealing uh, the underlying awakenedness of the mind. Uh, so this is another way of looking at it that's equally valid. So one, one way of looking at it is to cultivate the qualities of a Buddha, to, to bring up the qualities of an awakened being. The other way of looking at it is simply to remove the unenlightened qualities uh, and let what's already there shine forth, let what's, what's already there be, be apparent. Uh, so one of the concepts that we have in, in Buddhism is a concept of innate purity, innate wisdom, innate compassion. Uh, that every single one of us has within us a, uh, a natural quality, uh, a natural capacity, a natural uh, set of characteristics of an awakened being. Uh, it's just that we cover it up with all kinds of mm, filthy nonsense moment by moment. Uh, but beneath that, it's there. Uh, it's kind of like if you have a, a shining light and you pile it under a, a bunch of mud. Uh, it's not that the shining light isn't there, it's just that there's a bunch of mud on top of it. If we scrape the mud away, then the light shines through. Uh, so then in that perspective on practice, we're just working to clear away the unwholesome tendencies of mind uh, so that radiant light can, can manifest. It can be uh, apparent. 
So these are, these are two ways of looking at Buddhist practice that are equally valid. And, and in fact, our practice usually is always going to incorporate both, both of these. So one is the active development of wholesome qualities, the active development of qualities that uh, are in line with, with enlightenment. And the other is the active uh, diminishing and removing, uh, reduction of unwholesome qualities. The reduction of qualities which are not in line with enlightenment, which are not in accord with limitless, perfect wisdom and compassion. So our practice then, uh, and uh, at this point you might also be wondering, so what is enlightenment and why should I care about it? Uh, and, well, first off, what is it? And then you can decide whether or not you care about it. Uh, I remember um, two or three years ago, I was invited to a conference, uh, less of a conference, more of a uh, panel discussion. So there was a group of Buddhist and pseudo-Buddhist teachers uh, in, in front of an audience, uh, and a topic would be brought up, and, and we would each present our perspectives, and there'd be some discussion around it, and the audience could participate to a certain extent. Um, and one of the major themes that was brought up was around enlightenment, like, uh, what is enlightenment? Um, why, why bother with enlightenment? Why, why have any interest in it? What's its, its purpose? Is there, is there any purpose in seeking it? Um, and at one point, someone in the audience said, I don't even know what enlightenment is, uh, therefore I'm not particularly interested. It's like, well, if you don't know what it is, how can you know whether or not it's interesting? How can you know whether or not it's appealing? Uh, it's like, if you've never had ice cream, then naturally you're not going to want ice cream. You have no idea what it is. Uh, but then you get your first taste of it, and you're like, oh, that's why so many people are obsessed with ice cream. Now I understand. It all makes sense. Yes, actually, I would like three scoops. Yes, thank you. How about four? One of each flavor. Uh, so it's like that. When we don't know anything about enlightenment, it's just this weird word like en light and meant what does that even mean to be filled with light? I don't want to be filled with light. That sounds kind of creepy. Um, or awakening. It's like, well, I'm already awake. I awakened this morning when that annoying person waving that annoying bell ran past my room. I was already awake. Um, I don't need to be more awake. In fact, I want to be less awake right now. I'd like to go take a nap right now. Um, so again, maybe not, not the nicest word. Uh, or realization, another word that we sometimes use to describe the goal of Buddhist practice. Realization. Well, realize what? What is it that we're trying to realize? What is it that, that we're interested in, in knowing directly? And do we even want to know things directly? Maybe it's nicer just to space out and daydream all the time. Maybe being in touch with, with reality is not something that we're particularly interested in. So it's important to have some understanding. Uh, what do we mean when we talk about enlightenment or awakening or realization? What do we mean by these things? Uh, and why is it something that's appealing? Why is it something that, that we, we put so much time and effort into seeking? Why is it something that somebody would devote their entire life to? Uh, even to the point of, of giving up their hair and their mm, Fendi bag and their boyfriend and whatever else they gave up in order to become a monastic and commit themselves to enlightenment. Did you give up the Fendi bag? <laughs> <laughs> Next. Chanel. <laughs> um, oh, okay, close enough. Close enough. It's all the same in my mind. Um, Louis Vuitton. That's <laughs> you. Okay. Uh, so why would somebody do these sorts of things? What is it that is so appealing that it's more important than Chanel bags and partners? Well, I've never had a Chanel bag. I don't actually know what the appeal is, but apparently it's a big deal. Um. <laughs> Where was I going with this? Oh, right, enlightenment. Uh, well, if we put it in more simple terms, uh, what is it ultimately that we're seeking? 
What is it that we want more than anything else? Take a moment to ask yourself that question. What do I want more than anything else? Then ask yourself, why do I want that? So we come up with something like I want fill in the blank. I want a loving relationship. I want to be respected. I want to be successful, whatever that means to you. So whatever it is you think you want. And ask yourself, well, why do I want that? Uh, and what we usually boil down to is because I think that will make me happy. Because I think I will be happy if I have that. I, or you might say, well, because I think that will give meaning to my life. Well, why, why is meaning important to you? Because you think it will make you happy. Usually that's what it boils down to. One way or another. Is this, is this not true for anyone? Does anybody not want to be happy? Just checking. No? Okay. Um, there actually was one occasion where I asked this question and somebody claimed they did not want to be happy. But on further inquiry, it turned out they actually did want to be happy. They were just a little bit mixed up about what that means. So ultimately then, uh, one way of looking at enlightenment is that enlightenment is the attainment of unconditional, irremovable happiness. Uh, the Buddha says, Nibbanang paramang sukhang. Uh, enlightenment is the highest form of happiness, the, the paramount uh, pleasure, uh, the best form of, of happiness. Uh, and what makes it so particularly sublime, uh, first off, it is, uh, it's unshakable. Since it's unconditional, uh, it doesn't rely upon any particular circumstance. So take, for example, a relationship. If your happiness depends upon a relationship, well, got some bad news for you. Uh, relationships are impermanent and unreliable, just like everything else. Uh, even if you happen to find the absolutely perfect partner, well, either they change or you change, and things might fall apart. Uh, or if nothing else, one of you dies, um, as happens to everyone at one point or another. Odds are very good that one of you is going to die before the other one. It's very uncommon that two people die at exactly the same time. It does happen once in a rare while. Generally speaking, one person dies first. first. So even if you happen to find a perfect relationship uh, and it somehow manages to stay perfect, which I've never heard of happening, by the way, but imagine it somehow stays perfect, it eventually comes to an end. Therefore, it's not a reliable source of happiness. It's conditional. It depends upon conditions. It depends upon circumstances. Uh, or a more direct example, uh, coming back to the example of ice cream. So you're eating a bowl of ice cream. Well. That's all well and good for a couple of minutes. Uh, and then the bowl is empty. Well, what happened to all that happiness? Well, the condition is removed, therefore the happiness is removed. And so it's not reliable. And when we reflect on it, this is the only form of happiness that we know. Uh, we only know of the happiness that depends upon conditions. The happiness of getting what we want, the happiness of avoiding what we don't want, uh, that's really the only kind of happiness that we're familiar with. Uh, so enlightenment is, is pointing to something else. It's pointing to the capacity we have to be happy for absolutely no reason whatsoever. To be perfectly happy regardless of what conditions or circumstances we encounter. And uh, another quality of that is that it's unlimited. Uh, since it's not dependent upon any condition whatsoever, then it's also not limited by anything whatsoever. So for example, maybe you get a bowl of chocolate ice cream and you're like, okay, it's technically ice cream, but seriously. Uh, and then you get a bowl of vanilla ice cream and you're like, okay, now we're talking. Uh, this, is, this is definitely a couple notches up from that, that other flavor. Uh, or, uh, or whatever it is that, that's particularly appealing to you, whatever lines up most neatly with your own personal preferences at the moment. Uh, there's, there's variations and gradations uh, in how happy something makes you. But that's not the case with the unconditional happiness that comes from, uh, from enlightenment, from awakening. 
since it's not dependent upon any external condition, it's not limited by any external condition. Therefore, we're able to uh, experience an absolutely unlimited happiness, a limitless, unshakable happiness. So that's one of the major characteristics of, of enlightenment, one of its major appeals. Uh, it strikes directly at our deepest, our deepest wish, uh, that wish to be happy, that wish to be satisfied, that wish to be uh, contented, uh, that wish to feel okay. Uh, so it, it points directly at that and takes it to its pinnacle. Another element of enlightenment is uh, wisdom. Uh, so this direct, sharp, precise knowing of things as they are. Uh, so for those who place great value on knowledge, those who place great value on awareness, those who place great value on clarity, this quality of wisdom is extremely important. Uh, so uh, it's not the, the happiness of an idiot, it's not the, the happiness of, of somebody with perhaps a crippling brain injury or, or severe ignorance. Um, so there's this old saying, ignorance is bliss. Well, actually, from a Buddhist standpoint, it's the polar opposite. Ignorance is suffering. Uh, ignorance is, is not knowing uh, what the causes of, of happiness are. Ignorance is not knowing what the causes of suffering are. Ignorance is not knowing how we can shape our lives, how we can shape our minds to be free of discontent, to be free of dissatisfaction, to be free of, of pain and misery and torment and confusion. So ignorance is not desirable at all. Uh, what's desirable is understanding, understanding the nature of our own mind, uh, understanding how we shape our reality moment by moment, understanding how we shape our experience with every choice that we make. Because that wisdom is what allows us to choose to be happy. It's what allows us to choose to be content, what allows us to choose to be satisfied. Uh, it's what allows us to recognize each experience as it arises, uh, and to know that since the experience is completely known, completely understood, uh, it cannot disturb us, it cannot agitate us, it cannot upset us. We know it for what it is, therefore it has no power over us. So that wisdom brings with it uh, the, the power to be free mm, from external disturbances, to be also free from internal disturbances, uh, the power to be free from, from any manner of disturbance. Another critical element of enlightenment is, is boundless compassion. Uh, so this quality of, of gentleness, uh, of kindness, uh, in the mind, this, this power of, of genuinely uh, wishing the best, genuinely wishing for, for the maximum happiness and benefit of all beings. And uh, this is something that actually arises naturally uh, from the development of wisdom and the pursuit of happiness. Uh, so one of the, the elements of wisdom that we start to develop is the recognition that since each moment, who we think we are, is shaped by past conditions and present conditions, and each moment, who we think we are, is constantly changing, constantly being rewritten, redetermined. Uh, and the same is true of everyone else. Uh, we start to see that ultimately there's no separation, there's no distinction between us and others. Uh, there's nothing that makes, makes me any different from you. Uh, and even the line between me and you is something arbitrary, something meaningless. Uh, what we consider to be individual beings, individual people, is just a collection of constantly changing components. Uh, so the components of your mind at one point were the components of my mind. The components of your body at one point were the components of my body. Uh, and this exchange is constantly happening. We're constantly uh, exchanging components, uh, 
copying or rewriting or, or altering uh, these components, just shifting them around. But there's nothing there which we can ultimately say is me or you. So there's no clear um, boundary line between beings. Uh, and we also start to recognize that desperately trying to hold on to uh, a single chunk of reality as being me uh, is, one, painful, two, absurd, uh, and three, useless. Uh, it's, uh, it's absolutely impossible to achieve. Uh, everything is in a constant state of change, moment by moment. Um, so trying to hold on to a rigid self-identity is, is futile. Uh, but also trying to hold on to a rigid self-identity is, is painful because situations are constantly changing. Uh, within that flow and flux, then uh, whatever it is that we think of as me naturally has to shift in accordance with it. It naturally flows in accordance with it. Uh, so trying to cling to a solid self-identity does us absolutely no good. Uh, what comes to mind is the first time I, I was in a wave pool. Who here has been in a wave pool? Um, so it's like a swimming pool that produces artificial waves. Uh, so the first time I was in a wave pool, uh, I was quite young at the time. And um, at first the waves were coming slowly and I was like, okay, okay, this is fine. And then they started coming faster and faster and I started getting scared. Like it started to be really like deeply terrifying. So I, I went over to the side and I tried to hold on to the side to give me a sense of stability. But actually trying to, to get stable by holding on to the side just meant that I was being battered by one wave after another. Uh, if I had just let go of the side and just relaxed into it, then there's no problem. Your body just floats up and down with the waves. But since I was trying desperately to hold on to some solidity, some stability, then I felt the full force of each wave. Uh, and I started panicking. It was, it was actually really uncomfortable. It wasn't remotely close to fun. Everybody else seemed to be having a good time. I was not. Uh, but the problem wasn't the waves. The waves were just what they were. It was just this flowing change of, of conditions. The problem was that I was trying to hold on to stability in a situation where stability is impossible. That's what was making it such an incredibly unpleasant experience. So it's like that, uh, moment by moment. Um, we're constantly in the midst of this flowing waves of experience. Uh, and in the midst of it, we're desperately trying to cling on to a solid, stable self-identity. Uh, and that's making, uh, it's making it so that all these shifting conditions are just battering against this artificial, artificial bastion uh, of personal identity. Uh, and it's exhausting, it's painful, it's upsetting. Uh, it's something which is constantly uh, attacking who we think we are. But if we can relax into it and just recognize, okay, there's nothing here that I need to protect. Uh, I don't need to hold on to my viewpoints. I don't need to hold on to my preferences. Uh, I can shift and adjust and flow uh, along with everything else. I don't need to hold on to any barrier or perimeter uh, around my self-identity. Uh, I can allow my self-identity to be fluid. Uh, if we can allow that, then there's no problem anymore. Uh, we recognize there never was a problem. It's just reality manifesting as it does in a state of constant change. Uh, so then we start to feel a sense of connectivity and identity with other beings. We recognize that other beings are no different from ourselves. Uh, they're not separate from ourselves. Uh, so then uh, we recognize also that just as we wish to be happy, so does everyone else. Uh, just as we wish to be free of, of confusion and torment, so does everyone else. Um, and we recognize that this uh, attachment to me this desperate attempt to cling on to me as being somehow separate and different from others is causing a great deal of that, that distress and torment within ourselves. So releasing that self-grasping, that self-clinging, and opening up to a genuine kindness and positive regard towards other beings brings with it, one, a great deal of happiness immediately, a great deal of, of joy, a great deal of bliss. 
but it also helps to to soften those barriers of uh, of self grasping. It helps to soften the edges of of self identity, uh, which allows us to more clearly see. Uh, to more clearly see things as they are, to see reality as just being a, a flux, a flow of impersonal components. Uh, to see this body and mind as just being an arbitrary, arbitrarily defined domain in which things are flowing in and out all the time. It's like with the oceans. Uh, we say that there's however many oceans in the world and however many seas in the world, but actually, if you look on a map, there's just one interconnected body of water. There is absolutely no barrier between the Pacific Ocean and the Indian Ocean. It's completely meaningless. Uh, oh, I'm sure some politician at some point pulled out a map and drew a line and said, well, on this side, it's the Indian Ocean. On this side, it's the Pacific Ocean. But if you actually go there, there's not some glass wall between the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. Not yet. They might do that someday. Um, there's not some glass wall that separates the, the two oceans. Instead, there's just one seamless mass of water continuously flowing, 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 flowing. Like flowing from one place to another, shifting and changing and intermixing. Uh, you can't pull out one sample of water and say, okay, this is the Indian Ocean and this is the Pacific Ocean and they're completely different. That's no, just the same water uh, intermingling. Uh, so it's the same uh, with, with everything in reality, actually. Everything is just all these components continually intermingling and mixing and flowing and shifting and changing. So uh, recognizing that uh, necessitates starting to put down these, these boundaries that we draw around who we think we are. Uh, it necessitates opening up to the possibility that who we think we are, the, the components that we think of as me, are not actually me. They're not mine. Uh, they're just visitors that come and go. They're just tourists wandering through this arbitrarily defined domain. Just as you can't take a, a cup of water and say, this, this is definitely the Indian Ocean and not anything else. Well, if you were to track those molecules of water over a course of time, you'd probably find it wanders through all the oceans. And at times it's in the clouds, and at times it's in the rivers, and at times it's in human bodies. Uh, it's not distinctly Indian Ocean water, it's just, it's just water. It's just this, this unowned, unclaimed component, which is always shifting, uh, which arbitrarily defined domain it happens to currently be part of. So what we find then is that then we realize there's nothing that we need to, to protect or to hold on to. Uh, and we also recognize that that attempt to hold on to any particular component of body and mind is just something that, that makes us uncomfortable. It's something that produces a continual sense of, of um, urgency and uh, confusion and uh, discontent in the mind. So, cultivating compassion is a way of helping us to soften those boundaries of self-identity. And cultivating wisdom is a way of helping us soften those boundaries of self-identity. So that at the pinnacle of Buddhist practice, uh, at the attainment of enlightenment, the distinction between wisdom and compassion uh, melts away. Uh, it's, it's recognized as being one and the same thing. They're recognized as being inseparable qualities. So without wisdom, there can be no true compassion. And without compassion, there can be no true wisdom. These qualities are uh, not separable at the highest level. So that's ultimately what we're, what we're aiming at. We're aiming at this, this boundless, unconditional happiness, this perfection of wisdom and compassion. Uh, and the question is, how do we do this? And so I spoke about in each moment making choices, either choosing to move towards awakening or choosing to move away from it. Well, choosing to move towards awakening is recognizing where we're holding on, where we're caught in greed, hatred, or delusion, where we're caught in self-attachment, uh, where we're caught in self-centeredness, where we're caught in ignorance or confusion, 
uh, and letting go of that. Uh, or on the flip side, the active development of wisdom and compassion, the active development of uh, gentle, loving, selfless mind states, uh, the active development of clear, discerning awareness, uh, the active development of equanimity and contentment. So these are choices that help us move towards awakening. And this is done, uh, again, it, it's done right here and right now. Uh, and mm, it's not something which needs to be done in a particular order. So it's not like you do step one and then step two and then step three and then step four. Uh, but actually in each moment we're cultivating uh, as much as we can, as much wholesomeness as we can in the mind. Uh, so sometimes it's said, well first you need to develop sharp awareness and then you need to develop strong concentration and then you need to develop this and this and this and this. And it's like, well for some people at some times in some places under some conditions that's true. But actually sometimes we start by developing gentleness. And at other times we start by developing concentration, and other times we start by developing uh, wisdom, and other times we start by developing uh, mindfulness, and at other times uh, we start by developing acceptance, we start by developing equanimity, uh, and at other times we're developing multiple um, qualities simultaneously, we're developing multiple aspects of the path simultaneously. So it doesn't need to be a, a strictly defined procedure, uh, but rather it's each moment, it's, it's asking ourselves, what direction is enlightenment from here? And how can I move in that direction? So when we're seeing the mind gravitating towards obsessiveness, then we steer the mind away from obsession. Uh, when we see the mind gravitating towards hostility, we steer the mind away from hostility. When we see the mind gravitating towards sensual desire, we steer the mind away from sensual desire. Uh, when we see the mind gravitating towards spaciness or daydreaming, then we steer it away from spaciness and daydreaming. And we recognize that's, that's the path that just leads deeper into confusion and turmoil. Um, and instead, we, we ask ourselves, so what can I do to cultivate clarity of mind, to cultivate sharp, precise knowing? Uh, what can I do to train the mind to be collected, unified, uh, wieldable, focused? Uh, what can I do to develop uh, concentration? Uh, we ask ourselves, and uh, how can I develop uh, a recognition of the impermanent, constantly shifting nature of experience. Uh, particularly if we notice we've slipped back into the, the misperception of solid, stable objects. How can I restore that, that recognition of the insubstantial, ephemeral nature of experience, the insubstantial, ephemeral nature of, of all sensation, of all perception? And wherever we notice any, uh, any solid self-identity, I am this, how can we soften that a little bit? How can we start to erode that attachment to self-identity? And all through this, recognizing the sense of relief, the sense of, of bliss, the sense of joy, uh, the sense of happiness and contentment that comes with every step of the path. Uh, so Buddhist practice doesn't need to be with clenched teeth and clenched fists and tense and mm, I must break through. It doesn't need to be this, this tense struggle. Uh, its quality is more one of relaxing into the spacious, serene bliss of wisdom and compassion. Uh, it's relaxing into that innate purity of mind. So there's times when, when putting forth effort is exactly what's needed. Um, and there's times when relaxing is exactly what's needed. Um, and usually it's the opposite of what we want to do, by the way. When you want to relax, that's probably the time to put forth effort. Um, when you want to strive, that might be the time that's better to relax. 
so we need to be honest with ourselves. Once again, asking ourselves, what leads towards awakening? What leads away? That's really all it comes down to, moment by moment, moment by moment. So being really honest with ourselves. Uh, because what we tend to do all too often is to justify doing whatever we want to do. It's like, well, right now I want to eat ice cream, therefore ice cream leads towards awakening. Uh, right now I want pizza, therefore pizza is the path to enlightenment. So we, we make these justifications, and it sounds silly, but actually we do this all the time. Um, we go and we sit down to meditate and we're like, well, I don't really feel like putting forth any effort. So today, spacing out, that's good meditation. Well, no, no, it's just wasting time. Um, we may want to space out, but that doesn't mean that it's good meditation. Uh, we may want to daydream or plan our novel or whatever it is, but it's not the time for that. That's just wasting time. Uh, in this context, I mean, there's there's another time for planning your novel. It's just not during meditation practice. Uh, so it's, it's generally seriously asking ourselves that question in each moment. How can I point the mind towards awakening? How can I constantly move the mind in the direction of boundless wisdom and, and compassion? How can I continuously uh, relinquish desire, aversion, and delusion? How can I continually cultivate equanimity, uh, awareness, gentleness, moment by moment. And all through this we notice that quality of happiness that arises. So when the mind is filled with, with irritation or hatred or resentment, is that a happy moment? No, it's quite uncomfortable, it's quite painful. Uh, when the mind is filled with kindness and gentleness and compassion, how is that? That's actually quite nice, it's quite pleasant, it's quite enjoyable. Uh, when the mind is in confusion and turmoil, is that pleasant? Not really, it's actually quite unpleasant. Uh, when the mind is sharp, clear, alert, aware, how does that feel? Actually kind of nice, it's like, oh, okay, I'm on top of this, it's all good. Uh, so, again, noticing uh, the Buddha said mm, that the Dhamma is, uh, it's good in the beginning, it's good in the middle, and it's good in the end. Um, he did not say it's painful in the beginning, painful in the middle, and it only starts to be good after 30 or 40 years. That's not what he said. He said good in the beginning, good in the middle, good in the end. So our practice then can be a joyful practice. It doesn't need to be this terrible, painful slog through mm, cow traps and landmines. Um, though it can feel that way sometimes, I can't deny. But when it feels that way, it's usually because we're not approaching it with the right attitude. Uh, often, uh, when our practice starts to feel like some painful slog, it's because we're thinking, oh, I have to do these things that I don't want to do. I have to give up these mind states that I don't want to give up. I have to relinquish things I don't want to relinquish. And what we're missing is that all we're letting go of is our suffering. There's one discourse where the Buddha says, all that's arising is dukkha, and all that ceases is dukkha. So it's just dukkha arising, and it's just dukkha ceasing. So we get so wrapped up so wrapped up in like, well, but I, I, I really like this, I don't want to let go of it. Just relax. You don't lose anything except your suffering. You don't lose anything except your pain. You don't lose anything except your, your inner torment. You're not losing anything valuable. So you cut off your hair. Well, big deal. You didn't lose anything. The hair is still there, it's just not attached to your body anymore. <laughs> it's just disintegrating into the soil somewhere. Well, that's fine. It'll become vegetables next year. Um, so even more so, rather than have it stuck to your head where it's not doing anybody any good, next year it can be someone's salad or someone's rice or someone's zucchini or something. Isn't that wonderful? So why are we so desperately 
holding on to like, no, I must have these stringy things coming out of my head. It's like, well, why is that such a deep source of attachment? Uh, so it's, uh, and even more so with all of our, our views and opinions and preferences, we hold so tightly to them. It's like, well, I want it this way and I like it to be that way and I prefer it like this. And well, why we could just relax and recognize, well, this is just how it is. It's like, well, I didn't really want potatoes today. I wanted something else. It's like, well, tough luck. What are you stuck on? You're stuck on your preferences. What's the problem here? your preferences. Um, so when we let go of the preferences, then we realize, oh, there's nothing wrong. In fact, there's something to be grateful for. Uh, I should be grateful that I have food, even if it's not exactly the kind of food that I normally like, or exactly the kind that I would prefer to have. Um, I can be joyful uh, that I have something to, to nourish the body and sustain the mind. Or even if there's nothing at all to eat. It's just like, well, okay. I can be fine with that as well. I can notice these sensations arising and ceasing in the body without being disturbed by them, without being agitated or upset by them. So once again, all that's arising is dukkha. That is, when we cling to things, when we hold on to a rigid set of preferences and ideas. And all that ceases is dukkha. When we let go of those rigid expectations and ideas, uh, when we open up to this constant flux, this constant flow of sensations arising and ceasing. Um, because ultimately that's all our experience is. It's just sensations arising and ceasing. It's not you. It's not yours. It doesn't belong to us. It's not who we are. It's just sensations arising and ceasing. Uh, and when we observe that, then we can finally let go. Uh, because we realize there's nothing we can hold on to anyway. Uh, we keep trying to grab something that can't be grabbed. It's like trying to grab a handful of air. It's like, why can't I hold on to it? It's like, well, it's just not something that can be held on to. Uh, and every time we try to grab, we're just producing pain and tension. But when we stop trying to grab, then we just realize, oh, the air flows in its own way. Uh, it's right here just shifting and flowing in its own way. Uh, and trying to hold on to things is, is futile. So it's the same with experience. Uh, we watch the experiences flowing through the mind, but without holding on to anything in particular, without latching on to, I like this and I hate that, I prefer this and I avoid that. It's just watching it flow through the mind and recognizing the serenity and joy that comes when we observe that shift and flow without preference. So I should probably stop talking or else I'll just keep rambling on for another hour or two. Um, so I think I'll close it at that point. Um, 